Overtime was created by Matt Holman, founder of the EMW Foundation, and is made possible by the Prodigy Media Group and RPM Athlete Performance. With inspirational credit to my friend, Dr. Fred O'B. Welcome to Overtime, an open conversation series on racism in the sport of lacrosse. We hope you find this thought provoking, educational, and it leaves you better prepared as a member of the lacrosse community. Thanks again for joining us. And now for this week's panel. All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Matt Holman. I'm the host, and we're just going to have a lively conversation about uh, racism in lacrosse. I've got a number of panelists I'm going to read off to you. Trevor Tierney, Princeton grad, one of the smartest players I've known, uh, vice president at X LXTC Lacrosse out of Denver. They run all the programs for the uh, University of Denver and camps and clinics and such. DJ Loops, he's a Florida Southern College grad, um, human movement and performance exercise science major, assistant coach at Florida Southern now. He was at Michigan State, the MCLA. Welcome, DJ. Leo Paytas, an old friend of mine, University of Penn. I won't say what year he graduated, but bachelor's degree in civil engineering. Leo's a senior manager director, specializing in global corporate real estate at Newmark Knight Frank, excuse me. And he also ran the Summit New Jersey Youth Lacrosse Club for 22 years. Uh, Scott Burnham, welcome. Cornell University grad, human development and psychology major. Uh, also the GM of the Iroquois national team and currently resides in Maryland and he is a Maryland United Lacrosse Club coach for girls at the youth level and the boys Green Hornets team also at the youth level. Uh, Brian Solcott finished playing his lacrosse at Nazareth back in the 90s. Uh, he is the executive director of the Fire, Firehawks Lacrosse Club in Redwood City, California. He also serves on the board of directors of US Lacrosse and is currently working with the Jamaica program to develop their national and domestic programs. Uh, Malcolm Chase, Whittier College grad, business administration major. He is the founder of RPM Athlete Performance out of Boston, and he is also one of our informal co-sponsors, offering up his services of his company to help us get this going. Appreciate that. And last but not least, Trevor Baptiste, Montclair, New Jersey product, graduate University of Denver in real estate finance. And Trevor, as you know, is a professional face-off specialist in the wearer of cool eyeglasses. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, guys. Uh, sure. <laughs> on, <laughs> on behalf of uh, everyone on the call and everyone watching that watch this, I appreciate you guys taking the time to have a discussion about racism. We know it exists in the world. It's the forefront of the uh, conversation right now. And uh, my point of view, I couldn't be happier to have you guys on the line. So I'm just going to be lobbing questions out and uh, you guys can use the hand raising technique or, or just chime in and let this conversation start. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to start with a good one here. Uh, one of you guys submitted this question actually. Um, what conversations have you had regarding racism over the last two weeks? And I'll start with you, Malcolm. Uh, thanks, Matt, and, and thanks for including me. It, it's an honor to be in this collection of people. This is, this is a great group of guys, um, many of whom I know, and many I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to get to know this evening. Um, I've, I'm from Yarmouth, Maine, um, which you know I've had some conversations with family. I've had conversations with colleagues, um, current and former students of mine, um, black, black and white, and um, you know, I, I wanted to have a better understanding. I, I can't pretend to know what it's like to be a black athlete in the game of lacrosse. Um, so I reached out to some that I coach now, and, um, and it was really important to me to kind of understand perspective. And I have a 14-year-old a, a um, black lacrosse player who is probably one of, if not the best, players in the country, in my opinion. And I learned a lot from him and his father in a conversation earlier this week, uh, uh, things that we had never discussed before because it never came up. 
I, I, I recognize him as a, 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 a black uh, player, but I don't, I don't identify him that way. At least I didn't think so until we had our conversation. Um, so some of the things I've learned, you know, was one, how difficult it is for this young man. You know, 14 years old, he described situations to me that had occurred over the last couple of years, not just at 14, but at 11, 12, 13 years old. And he's been playing, you know, since he, since he was knee high. So who knows how long this has been going on. But um, situations where he's been called the N-word on the field, um, situations where, you know, regardless of his, his talent and ability, he was al already kind of um, considered in the category of defensive players, defensive midfielder players. Um, I know there have been conversations around that. And the fact that if he responds to that type of behavior, even though he's justified in doing so, he, he looks bad. It makes him look even worse. And, you know, that, that struck me as, as you know, real, something really powerful that someone, someone feels uh, less empowered to do that, even though I think many of us, I think all the, everyone in this group and many of his teammates who stand up for him, um, you know, and get his back there, the other thing that really stood out to me, and I'll just be brief, was how hard he works. And I always thought that this young man worked so hard because he just loved the game of lacrosse. And what really floored me was that he's not working that hard just for the love of the game. He, they use the expression, we have to work twice as hard to get half the respect. And that, that struck me. I was like, wow, I thought this kid just loved the game of lacrosse. And he, I realized he's working so much harder for a bigger reason than I'd ever realized because I didn't bother to ask him. And, and so I was grateful for that conversation. You know, we spoke for almost a couple of hours the other night and it was, um, it was powerful and meaningful for me. You know, um, I had one, one black student in, in my class, you know, in my entire school rather, um, in Yarmouth, Maine, you know, so that's, that's where I come from. So I obviously have a lot to learn. Um, but I've, I've been learning and, and, you know, I was very appreciative to him and his father for, for sharing with me. Right, right. And, and you know, you, you touched on where you grew up and that's, start, that's where it starts. Uh, you know, if, if for no fault of your own, you're born where you're born. Uh, if you're born in an area where it's not very mixed uh, population or ethnicities, you just, you never, it never occurs to you, as you said. Um, DJ, your thoughts on that same question. What conversations have you had in the past uh, 10 days, two weeks or so? Um, you know, I've been blessed to have uh, some good conversations, some with uh, strength staff at our school. Um, young man who came with us, uh, just came in from Georgia, Coach Marr. Um, but we were, you know, we were talking. He, he reached out as one of the first people um, to reach out to try to uh, understand you know, where, where he can do more. Um, but on top of that, you know, I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, for a little background, sorry. Um, I'm adopted uh, from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was adopted by uh, a white family um, right away. So my, my experience, um, you know, is, is um, it's, it's pretty mixed, you know, and uh, just to touch on it, Trevor, your story, uh, you know, was, was very, uh, it shed a lot of light on feelings that I've had just because, you know, I, I'm used to being called an Oreo or anything else or, um, you know, any, any one of those just because, um, you know, I don't, I don't fit what we perceive to be, um, you know, black uh, in America. Um, yet, you know, if I don't open my mouth, technically I present that way. Um, so the conversations have just been, um, you know, how, how do we go forward? What are things that I can do? Um, what are things that certain individuals can do to, to address um, the issues in their community, right? Because obviously, um, you know, protests are phenomenal for drawing attention. Um, you know, money speaks, especially in this country. Um, and so the conversation is how, how do we get more money moving towards things that matter, um, whether that be you know, towards scholarship funds to bring, um, to bring the game to, to urban undeveloped areas. And I know Trevor, you guys have a, a, a heavy hand in that. Um, and that's awesome. Um, and I think, uh, it's, it's just, yeah, where, 
where and how do we progress? So, um, uh, you know, been blessed to talk with uh, Coach Ward, who's my head coach, and he was, again, one of the first guys to reach out and figure out what can we do as a program at Florida Southern. Um, because Florida Southern is uh, a small private school in Florida, and um, although it's developing um, and changing, there's still some pockets of resistance um, to just change in general, um, you know, progressive thoughts. Um, so the thought would be, yeah, like, what can we do as a school, uh, as an athletic department, as, as specifically a men's lacrosse program? Um, and, you know, no, no pat on the back to us, um, pat on the back to us, but we, we pride ourselves in our diversity, um, which isn't saying much, sadly. It's like we have, um, we have currently, I think, three, three players of color on our team, which, which I imagine will make us one of the more diverse programs. Um, <laughs> Which is nuts. Uh, it's nuts. Uh, so I was blessed to play um, with three other players of color on my team. And, and before college, I was maybe on the football team with maybe two other black guys at one time. My school had maybe had at any given point 50 um, non-white player or non-white students in general. Um, that's just the area I grew up in. So um, the conversations again are just, you know, what, what are we doing? What are we teaching? What are we learning as we grow up and how do we change that bias um, through language? You know, what are we, what are we teaching ourselves? What are, what are we allowing our, our friends to say? What are you allowing your friends to say? Um, and things that you just kind of, that you would never think twice about, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's been illuminating um, reaching back and, and seeing, the the again pockets of resistance that you don't realize are there until you actually have to think about them um just another little tidbit i was so used to seeing um crazy but i was used to seeing um dumb things like swastikas carved in uh you know bathroom stalls that to me because i had never experienced anything else i just imagined that that's what most high schools were like um did i personally ever feel like victimized um in school no um i was very blessed again to have athletics as kind of my um is my privilege truthfully um and again i stood out so being good at sports doesn't hurt um but it doesn't make it okay so yeah just figuring out figuring out the language that uh, that we can kind of weed out uh, that we that we already deem unacceptable to other groups of people um, and making sure that we're not allowing that to pass by. Okay. Uh, going to you, Trevor Tierney. Uh, uh, so first of all, I just want to take a brief second to thank you, Matt, to pulling us, pulling us all together for this conversation and taking the energy to, to do that. Um, and, and also just want to thank the game of lacrosse for all the great people it's brought in my life and some of you guys I've, I've played together with or played against and Trev even gotten to coach you and feel really blessed to have had that opportunity. And you still like him. <laughs> which, which, which Trev? Yeah, which Trev are you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the joke is Trevor is, uh, is the favorite Trevor of my family now. He, he's, he's surpassed me. <laughs> um, uh, so you know to go to your question Matt of um, what conversations were, have we been having the one the what was most powerful for me this week was uh, you put me in touch with Dr. Fred Opie and uh, I got a text early one morning saying hey Trevor let's ha let's have this conversation on my uh, on my podcast <laughs> and um you know, I think before I had that conversation, I had a lot of fear around speaking publicly about this topic, not knowing if as a white male, I had anything of value to say, or if I would say the wrong thing, or, um, to, or, or, it, you know, even the fears of, of um, uh, keep this, the silencing fears of people um, lashing back at anything that I had to say. And, and what, I, what I realized from having that conversation with Dr. Opie was that 
it is really important um, for me as a white male to speak out about these things. And, and, and also from listening to his wife uh, speak on the same podcast that, uh, you know, we, we, we always uh, call our black friends when things like this happen and ask for advice of what to do. And the, the fact of the matter is, is white males are the ones creating the racism. So for us to uh, put that back on our, our, our black friends um, and community members, it, it's, it's really not up, up to them to do that for us. So um, listening to, to her speak about that was, was very eye-opening for me. And, and then just getting to speak out loud with Dr. Opie about these things, I, I realized that um, it, it is important to just have these conversations. And even, even if you're scared uh, as, as a white person to make mistakes, that it's like playing lacrosse, right? If you just go out and think you're going to be the perfect the first time, you would never end up, you would never end up playing. So you've got to go out. You've got to make some mistakes. You've got to learn from those mistakes and get better in the process. So um, that that conversation uh, with Dr. Opie this week was was a really huge one for me uh, in, in opening my eyes to to some of these things that were that were going on for me internally. And, and um, you know, I, I think my my hope for this conversation is that you know all of us together just having this conversation allows maybe younger players in the game or, or even coaches in the game or whoever it is watching us to realize, hey, it's okay to speak about this even if you don't know exactly what you have to say or even if you, you know you might make some mistakes because that, uncert that uncertainty is really where um, a lot of these problems lie and, and speaking speaking those things aloud uh, allow us to start to point out some of these issues and, and, and hopefully uh, start to come together towards working uh, towards a greater resolution. Right, right, very true. Brian Sokot, um, I'm gonna cut right to it. When, when you were, when was the first time you were called the N-word or were you ever? <laughs> uh, definitely have been. I honestly couldn't tell you the first the first time. Um, I, I can tell you about the time that stands out the most to me, sure. probably because there were you know moments in you know dating back to elementary school, and I can remember um, you know times when when it was when it was said. I think I think sometimes said without the child saying or even realizing exactly what they were um, saying to me. Um, it, it was not said to me ever throughout my high school career. Um, my entire um, high school and really most of middle school i never um had it said to me um but there was an incident when i was playing uh, i've posted about this on facebook before i was playing it at uh, roanoke college and uh you know i was pretty good in college and i definitely created a, a ruckus on the field you know i wasn't the gifted uh stick work guy but i made a mess of people running up and down the field and i'm carrying the ball up the field um in front of the bleachers and uh someone yelled out from the stands, uh, get that fucking nigger as I'm going up the field. Um, and it was, you know, loud and clear. Like there was no, no mistaking it. Um, and, you know, my, my reaction at the time was just kind of to ignore it and obviously continue playing and, and, and finish the game. Um, and the reason the moment stood out to me was because um, immediately after the game, uh, the athletic director from from Rono College, uh, as I walked out of the handshake line, um, came to me and said, "Brian, I'd really, I'd really like to sit down with you in my office afterwards and have a conversation." Um, and he brought me into the office, and and I was expecting, you know, the the uh, talk about, you know, this doesn't represent Roanoke, and you know, this isn't this isn't who we are, and that wasn't his thing at all. Um, he talked to me about was how I felt and was concerned um, to make sure that that, that I was okay. Um, and, and I'll never ever forget that Scott Allison, uh, he's still the he's still the AD um, mm -hmm. at Roanoke. Um, 
and it really meant a lot to me. I mean, it was it was it was significant significant and impactful for me that he didn't take the course of uh, you know trying to explain it away. Um, he didn't apologize for the kid. He didn't do any of that. He just was checking in to make sure I was okay and letting me know that also that it was going to be dealt with as well. Cool. Right. That's um, yeah. That's a that's a way to phrase that question because I I don't remember the first time. Um, I know it's happened, but usually it's just I'm like I can't deal with that person's ignorance. So um, I appreciate that answer. Um, I'm going to put this pose this to Scott and Leo. And um, first, I'll pose it to Scott. And, and you know, don't be, you know give us a little background and, and how you grew up. Um, just for those that don't know you as well as I do, I know your older brother. Obviously, we're at Syracuse together. Um, but have you ever been uh, coached by a person of color? Uh, and if so, what sport and in what age group were you in? Sure. Um, you know, I, as you know, I, I grew up in Syracuse, New York. And, and first, I also want to say thank you for uh, including me on this. I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this, this group. Uh, I think this is so important for us to be doing uh, today and, and every day to, to make sure that, that we write uh, the, the mess that, that we're in right now. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had, um, I've, I've been coached by and coached with alongside several um, coaches of color. Uh, I grew up in Syracuse and kind of a, a city school kid um, through, through elementary school. Um, mo most of our, our classes, we, we had tons of, tons of black kids, tons of white kids, tons of every color of, uh, that you could imagine at, at Franklin Elementary. And then um, went on to Lincoln Junior High and then Henniger and th throughout, you know, Pop Warner football and, and lacrosse and, and any of the sports I played. Um, I've been fortunate enough to, to have some great people either coach me or coach alongside me uh, that, that were uh, coaches of color. And I, I've learned a lot from them. I've been fortunate enough to, and, and to play alongside with some of those guys, you know, SoCat and I have played alongside each other plenty of times. And um, my, my high school team, I, I know uh, DL was saying that he was only one of three um, and, and I, I'm sure you know this, Matt, back in the days when Henniger was in the early 80s with Mark's team, um, you know, they, they had the Black Attack, which was, was three of the best midfielders in the state of New York at the time. Um, and, and then we, it continued through our high school. So, yeah, I was, I was fortunate enough to, to have several coaches um, throughout my, my youth and, and growing up that, that I've worked with that, that were Black. And uh, they, they, they were some of the best people I've ever worked with. Right. Leo, uh, same question to you, and I know I kind of could answer it because I grew up in the same town, but I'll ask anyway, any coaches of color in your career, um, lacrosse, or actually any sport, really? Yeah, so actually, um, going, I've just, uh, I'm kind of going through my brain, I, I, I never had a coach of color um, uh, in any of the sports, and even basketball, football, and, and lacrosse that I played throughout the years. Yeah, Matt and I, just so you guys know, and again, Matt, thanks for setting this up. And you know, one, of, one of the messages that I want to uh, articulate is the fact that this is going to be an ongoing discussion. Uh, we are in the first stages of this. We all need to continue to talk and have open and, and what may be uncomfortable conversations with uh, some people that don't understand yet. And uh, I think it's important that we all be patient, be respectful, um, be understanding and be responsible for our own actions. Um, but I think that it's a, um, um, you know, when we grew up in the 70s, um, it was a pretty middle class kind of neighborhood. And, and Matt and I basically went to the same grammar school together. Uh, I was the same age as his uh, older brother, Paul. And I tell, I, I told when Matt and I, I reached out to Matt earlier this week that actually started some of my conversations that I've been having all week. Um, and uh, I tell a funny story that, uh, Matt's mother and my mother both worked at the, uh, the local hospital here, uh, volunteering some time. And I can remember when I was like three, four years old that Paul Holman and I shared the same crib together as we were babysitting for, uh, my mother was babysitting for one of us. And uh, so we grew up together and uh, the community was pretty diverse. Um, and I, you know, it's, I just think it's, you know, this is a, a moment in time that we all need to capitalize. And as I said, it's, 
going to take a long time and we got to continue to have these conversations and to open up. Um, I, I had posted a, a, an uncomfortable conversation to Matt when we were talking on the phone guys. And I said, you know, I don't like this N word and I've never had it never liked that word. And, and I said, how do we get rid of that in, in our vocabulary? How can we just eliminate it completely that no one should be saying it white, black, red, yellow, whatever the word just is, it's it's just bad so why does anybody use the word still and you know and whether it's in music or in culture or whatever it's it's an uncomfortable it's a question that i'm trying to find answers to because i don't think anybody should use the word anymore brian you shouldn't be they, they shouldn't be yelling that to you on this you know when you're running up in the field that's not something that's should be acceptable by any standard so it's small steps like that that i think that we can continue to kind of make progress and opening up, you know, people's minds and 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 trying to work together and, and treat everybody equally. All right, I like it, and I agree. Um, and we did have that conversation about the N word, and I, I don't understand why anybody would use it in jest, in a lyric, in, in any way, uh, knowing what it's associated with. Um, and Trevor, to that point, Trevor Baptiste, excuse me. Uh, can, I, can I just chime in because I, I, I do have some yes. thoughts on why someone yes. might use it though. Because um, I, I think it's a, a something that people do and obviously with that word it's been done in a huge way. But when something negative is thrown at you, taking it in and making it your own, it, it can be a defense, it can be all kinds of things. I don't think it's odd at all that that's what ended up transpiring. And I, I think it's going down a tricky path to start saying to black people, yes, we created this word for you and it's now making it us uncomfortable that it exists at all. So you all got to stop using it too, even though it's part of your music and part of what you're doing. I, I personally don't like hearing it, even in music generally, although uh, Gary Clark Jr. has a song called uh, this land that uses the word in a completely different way than it's normally used. Um, I think that to, to 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 take that away from people that have have taken it in and turned it around in a way um, is is unfair and 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 really can't be done. Trevor. Yeah, you know, I think I'm gonna just kind of stay on the lines of that, and and I think it's. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I guess, like, like Silly said, you know, like, if you're, if you're talking about, like, a word that's been so ingrained in, Af ingrained in African American culture, and especially in music, and what's kind of happening right now is rap and hip hop is popular overall. Uh, you know, nationalities and, and ethnicities. And so now you kind of get, you know, maybe like a white middle schooler and they're like, oh, like, I want to be cool. Like, I, I want to say it too. And then they're kind of going off and saying it. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, like you guys, do you guys know what this means? You know, and, and there really isn't that educational piece. So, so Leo, I, I do understand like where you're coming from. And it's like, well, like, how can I hear it? or like my kids hear it in music and you know, that's what's, that's what's in right now. And then they're told not to say it or like told it like it's mean something bad, but they're using it in like a positive light. Uh, yeah. But I also understand like what Brian's saying and the fact that like it has been turned and it's been, it's been a word that is almost like, it's almost okay. saying. Yeah. What I understand. Saying? Yeah. No, I understand. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess, yeah. you know, like you have a, you know, like one of my favorite movies is Pulp Fiction, right? And I don't yeah. know, I, you know, we, we, we shoot around the house here and we, we quote a lot of movie quotes and stuff like that. But, you know, that, well, the word is used often in that movie. And right. if you're quoting it and you use that, you know, when, when Samuel L. Jackson's talking to um, uh, his, 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 his mob boss, you know, you, you're kind of like, okay, I got to be careful that I don't repeat that phrase you know, when I'm, when I'm in, 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 in jest with somebody that might be like, Hey, what are you saying? And like, I, I feel uncomfortable with it when it, when it, when it's presented in that, in a, in a group like that. 
right. you guys understand what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of things in Pulp Fiction you can't say to talk about. Good point. <laughs> I gotta, you got to have the right company now, Brian. You got to have the right company. <laughs> or, or even, I'll give, I'll give you a better, I'll give you another example of that. You know, like say, like I'm at a party in like college, high school or something, and we're playing music, whatever song's in, and like they're saying the M word, and I might only be the only black person there. Right. And everyone's like, like when it, when it like hits that, like when the word hits, maybe it's like right on like a fat beat. Everyone's just kind of like, like looking around or like, they're like, kinda like not going to say it. But like, what I was thinking is what if I wasn't there, you know, would they <laughs> lean it into it, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, it'll be like that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And yeah. like, it's not bad. Cause like, it's a song, you know, yeah. like yeah. we're just singing the song. Um, but I think there's definitely like you got to understand the 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 history behind it. I think that's what's important. Um, and, and I think probably uh, to to supplement what you're saying, Trevor, I totally agree with you. And I think one of the things that I think that 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 these some of these uncomfortable conversations need to be had so that you know both of us can be comfortable. Like yeah, you know, yeah, I understand the education of the word. I know where it comes from. I know what it you know what it means and what it's grown into. So yeah, so okay, Trevor, Brian, DW, you know, you guys all understand, you know, okay, and we're gonna have these uncomfortable conversations. But if the more that we have them, the more educated that we'll all be, and we'll all respect each other more going forward, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. Good Dallas, what are you hearing? Uh, you have a unique perspective because you are a high school teacher in, in a predominantly white community. What What are you hearing? Um, you know, before COVID, obviously, but what's your experience been in the classroom and even at, at the university level too with the, with the college team? I've never, I've never heard it in the classroom. Um, I mean, if you, you know, I, like you said, I, I teach at a predominantly white school. So if, if we were to hear it in the classroom, it would be, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be coming, you know, it wouldn't be right. Um, I did read it in a paper once and a student used it at, in a derogatory term. Um, and so we had to bring in the administration and deal with it that, but I've been teaching for 17 years and that happened one time. Um, but I was, you know, just flabbergasted. I grew up in a house where, you know, you don't say we, we didn't say certainly that word or anything else, you know, everything was all about equality and, you know, my conversations have just been with my kids mostly, you know, trying to get them to watch the media. I'm trying to teach them about the media and the different types of media and what you'll hear and how to learn from it. And just have conversations with them. Um, you know, they, they go to school with predominantly white kids too. So, uh, you know, our, our community is 30% Hispanic. Um, but they, you know, they just need to know that it's not okay. And I, I think you have to have that conversation with them so that they'll understand that, you know, it, you can't joke around about it. Don't sing it in the song, in my opinion, you know, skip that word. Um, I love hip hop and rap. I've been listening to it my whole life and um, I can't imagine repeating that word. Yeah. I do think there's a, a flip side to that as well. Um, you know, along what Trevor is saying and what Dallas is just saying now, that we also have to have understanding and have a conversation. And that, you know, if there's someone catches a video of some white girl singing a song and says the word, she shouldn't be hung up on the nearest light post for that. Like she shouldn't be, be drawn and, and quartered. If, mm -hmm. if, 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 if we find out it's a habit and, and it, you find out what's in her heart, then yeah, draw and quarter. But we do need to understand that it is being pumped into people's brains. And if it slips out, it's not time to execute. It's time to talk. Right. I think too, like, Matt, on, on those lines too, was there was, there was someone um, just recently, like really famous blogger, and she was singing a song and she said it and she got, she got you know, crushed she got crushed but why it was bad was she like blanked out all the other curse words but she said the n-word you know, so everybody was like whoa 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 whoa, whoa. Like, you can't do that you know you can't be, like if you're gonna talk dirty like talk dirty you know like so that like i get that you know like i get that sure yeah, Trevor, do one, yeah one one thing i just wanted to to bring up and, and this was something I talked with Dr. Fred with the other day is 
and, and Leo, I, I don't, I don't mean to pick on you here, but it, you know, it's a reason why I said at the beginning, it's good for us to maybe make mistakes and bring greater awareness. But one of the things we reflexively do as white people when talking about racism is we do kind of a whataboutism. And whataboutism is a social control technique that the Soviet Union used for their people. And right, look, look how the conversations kind of turned not, not even you know, 45 minutes in is we're already kind of talking about, well, what about, what about black people using this, this word? And it's really interesting that that's already happened um, because, you know, there's other things you, you see it all the time on social media. You see, well, what about kneeling? You know, that's disrespecting the troops. That, that's disrespecting the flag. It's like, whoa, how do, how do we get to that conversation? We, we we were Colin Kaepernick was taking a knee to bring um, uh, to bring attention to racial discrimination and police brutality in our country, and suddenly the the the, the, the all the white people have changed it to you're disrespecting the flag and disrespecting the troops. If we had just taken the time to listen to Colin Kaepernick. And, and listen to what he was trying to say through that, through that act, maybe we would have had these tougher conversations and, and, and maybe George Floyd's alive today. Maybe we're not in the spot that we're in. So I bring it up because I, I do it myself. We, we all make these mistakes of reflexively going to, to something else. And it's just, it's just a slight turn that takes us off the real, the real topic at hand. Yeah, I think, I think too, it's, it's just changing the narrative, right? Like, because it's uncomfortable. I, I mean, there's definitely some people that, you know, don't want to talk about it, you know, and maybe feel a certain way. Maybe they are racist or, or whatever, but there's a lot of people that aren't racist, but they just don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable for them. So they're like, oh, well, you know, well, let's talk about how he's kneeling about the flag. And then all of a sudden it's not about race. Like it's about, it's about the flag. And even now, you know, and, and I, you know, it's kind of controversial, but like all the rioting, like everyone, okay, let, let's talk about the rioting. Let's not talk about like what actually happened, you know, let's not talk about like why they're rioting or even maybe people are rioting because they are being opportunistic and they don't even really care. They're just saying like, oh, it's an opportunity for me to do something bad and not get away with it. But all of a sudden the narrative turns into oh my gosh, like people are rioting, people are breaking into stores, people are doing this, people are doing that. But it's like, whoa, 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 like, like let's stay on point here. You know, let's, let's stay on, let's stay about like the big picture, you know, because it's uncomfortable to talk about. But I think more so this time than any other time, and it's happened a lot, people are focusing on it, which is, which is good to see. Right. And to, to that point, um, I had a question here for you guys, for our panel of color. Um, and anybody can jump on this. When was your first time dealing with uh, law enforcement? And uh, what, you know, how'd you feel about that experience? Um, so I'll say that I've never really had a, a negative experience personally with law enforcement in my life. Um, I'm lucky enough, I've never been in the back of a police car in my life, something I'm I maybe mean, shouldn't be proud of. But I've never been in the back of a, <laughs> I'm of with a police you on car. That. I'm with you. Um, but I also, um, you know, I also grew up. I grew up in a small town, you know, where my best friend's uh, stepdad was on the police force, and I was a good athlete. And every cop in town knew who I knew who I was. Um, it was, it was, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't an issue for me at all, really. Um, and and I also, you know, I'm very careful in my life to ensure I don't put myself in situations where I'm going to have to deal with the, with the police. Um, you know, I, I, I fully recognize that, that the, the, the result could be bad for me. And so I don't, I don't get in situations, you know, I just, I'm, I'm very, very careful about it. I have been for my entire, my entire life. My father talked about it with me when I was very, very young. Um, and I knew the drill, you know, you just didn't, uh, you didn't do it. And, and so the the impact on me has more been around uh, you know being nervous 
um, you know, driving down the street at night and a cop car pulls behind me, even though I know I haven't done anything wrong, I get scared to shit. Like even today, to this point in my life, you know, things start going through my, through my mind. And, and, you know, it, it's a, it's a bizarre feeling. And you guys, I mean, I'm sure Trevor, you, you start playing with your own mind. You're telling yourself, don't be ridiculous. You know, you've done nothing wrong, but then your, your mind just starts spinning on you. And then you start thinking, oh my God, when this guy comes up to the window, he's going to see me like nervous and, and rattled and start thinking I did do something wrong. and I'm only going to make it worse. Like that goes through my line every single time a cop pulls up behind me, particularly at night. Um, and, you know, that's, that's maybe a bit of prejudice on my part and prejudging cops. Um, you know, I, my, 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 uh, my father-in-law is an ex-cop. My brother-in-law is a cop in New York City right now. My other brother-in-law is in, is in the FBI. So my relationship with cops has been wonderful throughout my life, but yet I'm still afraid. Right. And that's, that's what we got to change. Yeah. That has to change. Ryan, that, that, uh, that reminds me of my young player, you know, when he's working twice as, twice as hard to get half the respect and you're being twice as careful, right. To get half, half the respect on a, on a normal speeding ticket, a blinker out, you know, whatever, whatever the, the scenario, but you've got that in the back of your mind, much the same way this young man has in the back of his mind constantly, yet he's still able to perform. Um, that's just, it kind of, it, it just makes me feel like, you know, lacrosse can be that microcosm for, for real life. You know, that, that these, these things are real in sport as they are in life. And uh, it's something that we all have to be aware of. I, I hear you. And I think, I think another good thing that like phrase that I sometimes think about was like in the law, you know, you're supposed to be innocent until you're proven guilty, you know? But I see, I feel like when I see a police officer, I'm guilty until I prove to him that I'm innocent, you know? And like, I got to go over and beyond. Like, I got to really, really show him like, yo, I'm a good guy. I'm not doing anything wrong. Like, I'm okay. And then he's like, oh, okay. You know, like you're, you're innocent, you know? But like, you should have thought that when you, when you pulled me over or like, or like if you pulled me over for speeding, like that's why you pulled me over. You didn't pull me over because I'm black and I'm like selling drugs or like, this is not my car. You know, it's, this is what you're, this is what you're guilty for. You know, why are you doing it? I posted, uh, and I don't want to talk too much, but I, I, uh, I, I, I posted a couple things about, uh, my, uh, interactions with police officers and, and like, I love police officers Our my coach for the wings is a retired police officer, two of them. And, and one is a current, police officer. Um, and like, I love those guys, you know, like I have nothing against those guys and just because of their title, you know, um, and it would be wrong for me to think that, you know, but anyway, um, so when I was, <laughs> when I was, it's, I'm sure you guys saw the story, but I got, you know, kind of assaulted by a police officer, uh, for basically being on a jungle gym. Uh, and you know, he like, he didn't, point his gun at me but like he grabbed it and like undid it but then like kind of jumped me and then like threw me against a car and he was like asked me if I had anything that I could stab him with all this stuff and I'm the only black person there I'm with uh you know four of my four of my friends and two girl three girls and one guy and he didn't touch any of them like he didn't touch any of them I was the first person he he the other people could have just left. He probably like, he just turned his back to them and he put me in the back of the police car. He didn't even ask me like any questions. He didn't let me ask any questions until he came back. And meanwhile, this girl that, that I was kind of talking to at the time, she was like cursing him out. She's like, you know, like, screw you. You can't do this. Like while I'm getting assaulted and like, part of me was like, Oh, like, like, I like this girl. Like, you know, she's got my back. Well, the other part of me was like, yo, this girl's got to chill out. Like, don't heat this guy up. You know, like I'm being, like, I'm being so calm. I was the calmest person there. The other girl was crying hysterically. She's cursing him out. I'm the calmest person there. And I'm the one that's getting attacked. Um, and then obviously I was, I was 17 at the time. So I was able to ask him to call my parents and I got out of it. Uh, but 
you know, like he threatened me. He was like, move again and you're going to hit the pavement. And like, I think about like, if I trip or like, if I, if I like twitched or something, you know, it could have been a completely different story. Or if those two girls just left, if those two girls just bailed. And it was five minutes away from my house. You know, I'm like, I'm like, I live right up there. My parents are literally right up there. Um, but that doesn't change my perspective on police officers as a, as a, as a group, you know, I think there's bad people out there and, you know, getting that badge gives you more of a responsibility to do bad things and, and a longer leash, you know? Um, but that doesn't mean I think all police officers are bad. Um, another story I tweeted was I was driving to Lake Placid for the tournament for U19 and I was late. I was like three hours away and I'm driving pretty fast. Roads are open and I see this cop late and I like slammed on the brakes because I knew I was going fast. So I was trying to get to the game on time. And we like locked eyes. I'll never forget it. We locked eyes when I drove past him. And I'm like, all right, this guy's going to pull me over. I just pulled over and just waited for him. I just, right when I passed him, I was like, I'm just going to weigh in the shoulder. And I'm going to like get myself situated because he's going to come and pull me over. I don't want to make it look like I'm running away. Um, so pulls me over. He comes up. I got clothes in my front seat because I was threw all my stuff in the car. I got my gear everywhere. He's like, what are you doing? Like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm late for the Lake Placid tournament. He's like, you're three hours away. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm trying to cut time. I'm supposed to be here by this time. Obviously, I'm three hours away. And he goes, all right. Like, and then I couldn't find my registration. It like fell in between my seats. So I'm like scurrying around. I'm like, this guy's gonna, this guy's gonna take, tell me to get out of the car. You know, he goes, don't worry about the registration. Goes back, checks me. Like, no, it's never been pulled over. Never got a ticket before comes back, gives me like a $100, uh, like basically BS ticket. Like it, it was much lower than I should have got. And he comes up to me, he says, you know, like I'm giving you this up there. There's going to be cops that don't have your best interest. If you know what I mean, uh, they're kind of backwoods. If you know what I mean, and this is a white state trooper. He said that to me, he goes, this is your ticket." He explained to me how to, I, I pay the ticket. And he gave me his card and he goes, if anything happens, call this number. And I tweeted that. And then people were commenting like, oh, like there's still hope. And I'm like, yes, there is. Like cops are great, you know, but like think about what he just said to me, you know, like he just <laughs> told me that, that like to be late. And if I speed, like I might die, you know, another police officer said that about other police officers, you know? So it's like, like that's, that's something that I think some people miss when they saw the tweet. They were like, oh, like police officers are so great. Like, that's so great that you shared that story and that you don't like hate all of them. I'm like, I don't, but like, like he knows there's an issue, you know? Like he just took him for a, took him for a spin. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the whole point of this conversation is, you know, our experiences with racism at people of color, uh, how our friends on the other side of the ball uh have seen it or experienced it or witnessed it or, or dealing with it today and, and um where you grew up i think has a major part of it and, and uh, leo and i had the ability to talk over the weekend um at length about just cultural uh growing up how much of a difference it made and how things were not tolerated by all adults in general and they were kind of all on the same team you know, he shared that story, but I can take it a step further. I have gotten uh, admonished, I guess, by other parents when I was younger. And by the time I got home, my mother played that Jedi mind trick on me and was like, so what, what were you doing over at the uh, Smith house there? And I'm like, oh, nothing, just hanging out. You know, you try to walk away. And, and she'd always do the, yeah, really? As she's grabbing her wooden spoon. And then, you know, you'd start, <laughs> you'd start uh, humming it high, high. <laughs> You know, and then and she'd wait for you to tell a lie, and she was really testing if you'd tell the truth because the parent had already called. And back then, the parents believed each other. They didn't say, "Oh, my child's a golden boy or girl." Uh, they could never do that, or they, you know, they just took it for what it was. They acted up. You sent them home, and I'll deal with it. So um, culturally, you know, growing up, speaking wise, for you guys, and this open to everybody, you know, 
what did you experience when you were younger and what do you see now? I know a lot of you guys work with youth or have in the last five years, you know, what, what areas in lacrosse do you see of a big concern um, with the younger generation? Hey, Matt, I, I, I'd talk to this one. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up in, in Syracuse and I don't, I can't remember a time where, where I was never on a team that didn't have, a minority, whether it be teams I played with the Iroquois because technically we're minorities, right? Um, but I always had a person of color on every single team that I've played on throughout my entire career. Pop Warner football, um, youth lacrosse, high school lacrosse, JV, everything, and through club lacrosse. And one of the things I've always talked about as a member of the Iroquois is um, treating the game with respect and in doing so, treating everybody with respect. And it, that makes you obviously enjoy the game more, makes, makes the game better for you. It makes you enjoy your opponents more and your teammates, right? It, it just, it creates that level of um, I, I, I trust, I guess, is, is, is one way. But um, I, I still preach about the origins of the game. Anyone that I've ever coached, Anyone I've ever worked camps with, I've worked camps with, with, with Silcap for a number of years. Um, we, we used to do the talk about the origins of the game. And um, so, so that whole um, making sure that, that people are treated equal during, you know, through lacrosse, uh, it, it's a medicine game. You know, we believe it's a medicine game and it's, it's a game that can help with the healing. Um, and I've seen the, the bad side of it with, with having played with, with, you know, players of color and hearing the stuff – you know, Brian's story about being at Roanoke. Um, you know, I, I had a player that I played with for DeWalt, and, and I'm sure some of you guys know, uh, I remember du Duburn Reed, who w was, was a great midfielder at Syracuse, uh, uh, just a, a beast on the field. And we were playing with, with DeWalt one time, and, and someone had, had called him out and called him the, the N-word. And he let it go a couple times until um, it, it was finally too much. And, and he exploded a little bit, right? Never, never went after the guy, but um, it, it, he, he, he was visibly and, and physically upset and shaken, right? So th this whole thing, I, I don't want my kids to, to have to experience that, right? I have an 11-year-old daughter, 8-year-old uh, son. You know, I don't want them to, to witness the stuff that I had witnessed through playing with some of the guys that I played with, right? And, and, and the, the things that, that hurt them just because people were ignorant about uh, racism. Right. So we've had the talk with my kids and, and we're, we're continuing to educate them. And, and that's why I was I was really honored to, to be asked to be on this, because, as I said earlier, we need to keep talking. We need to keep this conversation going. And, and the more we do, the more people in the lacrosse world talk about it. Um, I mean, the story about Lyle Thompson at, at the Philadelphia Wings game uh, with, with the announcer, just, just an example of, of, of poor decision making by an ignorant person. Right. And, and it, it affected. Lyle in, in a, a very significant way and, and you know it, it made it all the way back home right so I, I think this is important and, and I think the more we talk about this uh, hopefully we'll see some improvement. I agree I agree. Uh, uh, Scott that you're, you're you and you made the comment about um about him exploding um, it reminded me of something that I've been thinking about a lot and I touched on a brief on something that I wrote and posted um, and I, I don't want to speak for the, for the other black guys on this panel but a lot of folks I have spoken to feel this way that, that there is a tremendously angry raging beast inside of me that I constantly constantly fight against um, throughout all my adult life and much of my childhood that is angry about the situation but the reality of life is you can't you can't run around angry all the time so you you find ways to get it down i i, I firmly believe that my parents taught me about love and that's what always beats it back um love and the love my friends give me beat it back but it's there and when you see a black person get really upset about the n-word that's that beast coming out like starting to like it can't be contained anymore um and for anyone that doesn't understand that feeling and how you can be 
this guy that seems so laid back and chill. Most people think, I'm a pretty chill guy. Like I, I roll with the punches. Um, I have a good time with people, but it's still there. And I, 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 the example I've come up with very recently is a guy named Gil Scott Heron, who is a musician um, mm -hmm. until re fairly recently, but you know was, was was doing most of his work in the in the in the 70s um, and late 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. He has two songs um, that if you listen to them next to each other, um, one is called Save the Children, and the other one is called Enough. Save the children is this light, there's a flute playing, it's happy, save the children. If we just keep moving forward, everything's gonna be okay. Enough is, I mean, it, it, don't play it for your, for your you know, 10 year old. It is <laughs> offensive, rude course, but it's, it's about his anger. What is enough? What, how, how much of us are you going to, to take? And it's his anger just pouring out. But the same guy, wrote, you know, Lady Day and John Coltrane, wrote uh, Save the Children, these nice, wonderful, happy, thoughtful, you know, songs. And, and I think that's inside of a lot of Black people. And I think that that's, um, for me, the thing that probably causes me the most stress as a Black person is keeping that down, um, picking and choosing the moments when you're going to address it at all, because it's easier just to, to let it stay back there than to let it start to come out because you don't know what's going to happen if it starts to come out. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I um, I'd have to agree with you on that, Brian, because you, you really do feel a lot of times like you just don't want to see me angry. You know, it's almost like that incredible Hulk inside of you. And it, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't spring up often. Uh, it's very infrequent. And as you get older, you definitely, um, you care less about others' ignorance, although right now globally it's it's an ignorance level that you can't ignore, and that's why we're having this conversation. And I thank you all for being here. But yeah, it's um, definitely uh, I I could say I've, I've been there with you on that that feeling. Yeah, that that word um, enough really resonated for me, Brian, right now because I've been in my talks with uh, other other white white people in my life of like it it feels like a turning point right now um and it may just may just be me or it may just be other white people in my life but it feels like there's this shift where we're finally hearing your anger we're finally hearing like the fear that you guys have to go through when getting pulled over we're finally hearing the grief of having another innocent unarmed black man die in, the, in broad daylight in the middle of the street. I think there's a shift where a, lo a lot of us are saying to ourselves enough. Um, we, can't we can't allow this to keep, keep going on and we can't keep being silent about it. Um, and then Scott, I also just wanted to, to piggyback off of what you said, uh, talking about the game. I think what what always amazed me about growing up playing the game because you know my father as a coach taught me taught me the history of the game and i was you know we were up in rochester when i was very young and i knew from a very er early age this was a game that all the native americans played throughout north america when white people first arrived so it always blew me away in the 80s that people would say oh you play lacrosse that's a that's a preppy white sport and I'd be like, no, that's not a, that's not a white sport. It's the most North American sport there is. And if North America is a, a melting pot of people, it, it's a sport that sh should have always been, um, uh, uh, always had that that identity in a, in a lot of ways. And I, and I think our game, because of the way it's been shared to all of us from the Native American people from, from, the, from, the, for, from the very beginning when we first got over here, we should be carrying on that tradition of making sure, sure it's shared with anyone who, want, who wants to play the game. So uh, just wanted to uh, just hear, Brian and, and Scott just wanted to reiterate both your points and, and uh, make sure you know you're, you're heard here, Brian. And Trevor. Thanks, Trevor. 
Thank you, Trevor. One, one of the things that, that we always say is, is to play the game with a good mind, right? And, and that's important. Um, and, and I think if we take that into life and, and treat each other with a good mind, um, that, that's, that's something that can be learned from, you know, the origins of the game. I, I think that's an important aspect as well. I think I, I, I'd agree with all three of you guys on that. And I think one of the most important things is that we all need to listen. Um, you need to listen. You need to have these talks. You need to be aware. You need to listen. Um, the, um, you know, you talk about uh, Trevor, Trevor B. You had said, you know, there's, there's good cops and there's bad cops out there. There's, there's criminals and there's, there's people that are protesting. Uh, um, and so we, we need to understand um, how, to, how, to, how to get through those bad people and get them off the forces or educate them so that they're a lot more respectful um, and get out and vote, right? You got to get out and vote in your local, uh, in your local governments, not just the general election, uh, because this is where your local police force is formed by, you know, you're appointed by your mayors typically in, uh, in the different municipalities. So as I said earlier, it's going to take a long time, um, but we need to act quickly and to get this, these conversations uh, more public. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and I'm going to flip this around because um, this got a good note came to mind. Um, Malcolm, Leo, Dallas, uh, any, Trevor, Tyranny, any of you guys, what's, what's the feeling when you get pulled over? Day or night? Have I been drinking? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Normal circumstances, no drinking. Making sure. I, 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 you know, not. You know, I still get very nervous when a cop comes up behind me. I, you know, I'm trying to figure out what I did and how I can try to get out of the ticket if I can. But my heart just, my heart races too. Um, and I'm, not, I'm sure not. I, I know I'm, I'm not nearly as much as my, uh, as my, as everyone else on this uh, panel. But uh, I, I get nervous. To the yeah. point. To the point of like thinking you could lose your life just for reaching for your wallet? No, no, no. That's what I said. No, no not, not anything like that. Although, you know, I, I do know that my dad always told me, like, you know, don't make a sudden move to the glove compartment when he's coming to you. That was, that was, you know, wait till he got to the, to the, uh, to the window. And then you say, okay, I'm going to reach my glove compartment. So that was, you now you guys know I'm the youngest of seven. So we had a pretty big family that was, uh, you know, and I was the runt of the family, so got the crap beat out of me a lot of times. But they would, uh, you know, get into you know uh, the trouble with the cops and summit was something that you know occasionally would happen, and you had to make sure that you you know were respectful. Right. Yeah, I've never you know getting pulled over is a scary thing, but definitely never thought, wow, I could lose my life from this. And but that's where that song, you know, enough. I, I don't want to see it happen anywhere in our country or around the world. It drives me crazy that, you know, I grew up thinking if you got a problem, you should call the police. They're there to help and protect and serve. And I really do that believe it's a hard job and the vast majority are really good people, but we've got to figure out a way to make it equal for everybody to have a, 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 an equal chance. Like Trevor said earlier, you know, innocent until proven guilty. It shouldn't be guilty until proven innocent. And we shouldn't have anybody losing their life over, you know, getting pulled over. Right. Yeah, and I, uh, my grandfather was MIPD his entire career. And uh, I trained jujitsu with some state patrolmen out here in Colorado, major of uh, state patrol out here. And I, I feel in incredibly un in uh, comfortable around police officers if, if I get pulled over, I'd say, you know, the, the one thing when these conversations around police come up is, is again, it, it does, the reflexive opposite comes. Oh, you, you guys don't respect police officers. Oh, you know, blue lives matter, all, all these things. It's like, no, of course we respect police officers. Most of them are great people that want to serve and protect. Um, but on the, on the flip side, there are really, re there are real issues that need to be addressed, including the sy systemic uh, racism within some police departments, including, you know, if, if you take race off the table, let, let's all talk about the militarization of police. We have police rolling around in tanks in our streets now. That 
that that's not what our country is all about. So um, I, I think it's a good question for all of us to ponder what our relationship with, with police are and, and let people know that for the most part, uh, we, we have a great respect for the people that are putting their lives on the line to, to um, serve and protect. But there are also um, some, some people out there that aren't doing the right thing. There's some police departments that are out there the right, aren't, that aren't doing the right thing. And there's some reform that needs to be had uh, in our country around police departments. Right, I'll, I'll bring this, pose this to all of you. Within our lacrosse community, um, you know, anybody can jump. What are, your, what are your most glaring takeaways as far as racism in the game, uh, past, present, and any ideas for the future? Something, something I think about, um, it's kind of, it's probably isn't the most glaring to me, but something that, that I thought was really interesting. And, and Malcolm, I kind of want to know your perspective with your player too. So, like, I know I kind of talked about, like, when I was a freshman in high school, uh, when I was a freshman in high school, I had a lot of racist things said to me. And I was the only black person on the team. Obviously, we know lacrosse isn't that diverse. And every year it kind of got a little bit better, you know, like, it's like kind of less things were said to me. And I always thought that, you know, all those people that thought that way were leaving, you know, and all the guys in my grade and like around me that were friends with me, you know, they, they didn't think that way. And I'm not seeing as much outright racism towards me. I was thinking the other day, and I think it's more of a power imbalance of power and influence. So when I was a freshman, you know, I was great. I was starting. I was one of two freshmen that played. But, you know, the team went on without me. I wasn't the best guy on the team. But my junior year, I'm a captain. I'm, like, the best guy on the team. Nobody's going to say anything to me, you know, because if it was a question of maybe one person that's racist and me, who's going to stay on the team, it's going to be me, you know, like I'm not, they're not going to, they're not going to kick me off the team, you know, and, uh, or like if, if there was an issue, everybody's going to side with me. Cause if I was like, all right, like, I'm out. If you guys think like this, they're going to be like, all right, no, no. Like we need Trevor. We need Trevor to, to win this thing, you know? Um, and I think that's really messed up because <laughs> if, if, if the things were all equal, that's not the case. And I, I was thinking, you know, what if I was in high school, I wasn't anything great, you know, like I was good, but I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't like an all American in high school the way I was in college. But what if I was like average, you know, and I was a senior and I was an average player. I kind of just did it for fun. I would probably still hear all that stuff. And I would quit. I would say, screw this sport. Like, I don't, like, don't want to do this. I'm going to go play something else. Yeah. And to, to that point, would you, you would, you would say you would quit as opposed to bring it to a coach's attention and, and, and trying to weed it out. Huh. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think, I think two, some, like two things on that. So I remember one time I was playing for a club team and like these kids were being racist. They were like making racist jokes. And it was me and this other guy who were the two black guys on the team. And the coach like stepped in and was like, stop it. Like, we don't talk like that. Like we don't do that. Like what the heck are you doing? And like, I respected that, you know, like I was like, you know, my coach has got my back. But when you're in high school, you don't want to be going to the coach and asking him, being like, oh, everybody's making fun of me. Like, can you help me? You know, you don't want to be that guy. Because um, you lose cred, you know? You lose cred that you're not sticking up for yourself. Yeah, and that's a, that's a double-edged sword problem. Because um, that's why I asked you that question. Because you're right. So a lot of people will not speak up. So as a white player or coach or person in charge administratively, 
um, that's something I think me very aware of and you don't have to cater no one wants to be catered to as a person of color but you certainly need to be aware of it and I certainly believe it goes back to the roots of the game like Scott mentioned um, I too luckily in Summit as Leo will attest to we were brought up in a game that you know we were told about the history maybe not as in depth as it could have been but enough to know that the Native Americans played it it's the number one sport I, I always agree. I always kind of attached it to like, this isn't a white sport. This is closer to my heritage than, than a white sport. So, um, you know, I, I, I see your point, Trevor, on and kids in high school and anybody else that's dealing with kids. What, what are your thoughts? Matt, if you don't mind, I just, I'll, I'll just kind of answer Trevor. So one that just strikes me is an immense amount of pressure, right? Like if you're the, one, just to be the man, everybody expects you to be the hero. And obviously you were, you were coming into your own during high school, but that shouldn't even cross your mind, right? Like the pressure should be because you're the man, not because you're black and you're the best player on the team or the, or the best face-off guy in the country, right? That should be your focus. So that that's just strikes me, you know, a lot of pressure, a lot of unnecessary pressure for you, um, which you deal with um, extremely well. Um, it's a credit to you um, just by the way you carry yourself in the game. I'm, I'm a fan, by the way. <laughs> I appreciate that. I've I don't want to speak for this young man, but I, I just one thing that his father mentioned, and he, he kind of defined diversity, right? Diversity was an invitation to the party, but inclusion is feeling comfortable to dance. And his son, his son dances. I mean, <laughs> in every sense of the word, the game flows through him, and I'm so excited for his future but I still know this is in the back of his mind. And after hearing him talk, I, I, didn't, I didn't even know he was dealing with half of this stuff, you know, at 14 years old. So inclusion's not there. That's clear, right? We're, we're open to diversity. We're starting to see, see more diversity with certain teams and, and they should, like in Nation United and I know there are several others. Um, but I don't know that inclusion is, is entirely within our game yet. I know it's not. I think I, her, I'll let you go. Yeah. I have actually uh, a few different points I want to I want to make. Um, the first one being is the one thing that when we look at lacrosse, we always have to recognize that lacrosse doesn't exist in a bubble, right? And it's always going to reflect society. We're not going to, you know, while America is racist, lacrosse will be as racist, and as long as America is racist, lacrosse will be racist. There's no other way it's going to happen, right? That's, that's just the way it is. Um, the second point being that. In my personal experience, my teammates in the sport of lacrosse have countless times um, been the ones that, and I'm talking about my, my white teammates, I haven't had a whole lot of black teammates in lacrosse, that, that intervened, you know, at a bar and someone two tables away makes a crack or something, you know, I, I, I'm not allowed to deal with it. It has always been my friends that have stepped up and said, no, 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 that, that ain't the way this is going down. Um, and, and that's something I, I, I love about lacrosse. I love about my relationships in lacrosse that, that so many lacrosse guys have been um, amazing for me in my life as friends, but also as guys that have gone over and above and, and, and dealt with issues um, that, needed, uh, that needed dealing with. Um, the last thing I am gonna mention about lacrosse, so something I've been thinking about recently, um, and I forget who just mentioned, was it Malcolm just mentioned inclu inclusion. Um, Obviously, a lot of black players that come into lacrosse are athletic guys, right? That's a, when you look at the games, a lot of athletic black lacrosse players. Um, it's something I've noticed it's often said, and I've even said it myself, and I started thinking about it recently. Um, you know, he's not a lacrosse player, he's an athlete. Um, and I know that was said about me for a big chunk of my career. You know, he's not really a lacrosse player. He's an athlete, you know, he's good at lacrosse because he's, he's, he's fast and strong. And I've thought about it more and more that, well, yeah, it's a sport. And so if I'm beating you because I'm faster and stronger than you, I'm better than you at lacrosse. And I am a lacrosse player. And I think we do it without even thinking about it, but it is othering the person. You're not actually a lacrosse player. You're just an athlete. You know, we're the lacrosse players. Um, I think that that's something that people do without even thinking about it, not even realize what, what they're actually saying, and not even realizing that that stigma and that label is most often attached 
to a black player. Uh, you know, that, that's the way it usually goes down. I think it, I think too, it's like, it's kind of back to that, that power element, you know, it's like, it's putting people below or above others. It's like, oh yeah, like he's good just because he's athletic, but he's not as talented as me, you know, or he's not, he's not really talented. He's athletic, you know? Right. Um, so it's like putting, then it like puts him below. It's like, oh yeah, you know? Um, yeah. Brian, they caught me by the way, when I, they asked me to describe this young man and I said, you know, he's a great athlete. He's got amazing footwork because he is constantly posting footwork videos. And his dad caught me and he said, what about his lacrosse IQ? You know what I mean? <laughs> what yeah. about his footwork? <laughs> you, you can see he shoots with both hands. And I, I had to back up and I was like, you're oh. right. You're right. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it is, um, that's real. I think just to touch on it, um, I think that's really all it is, right? We don't see as often anymore, overt racism, people throwing Confederate flags, you know, um, all the all the normal monikers you see, but it's it's just the it's the other is language of, you know, you just you're raw or, you know, like you said, he's athletic. Um no, I think that's 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 kinda all over the place. Um and I mean bottom line is it comes down to education. Um and we have to be good with calling people out for those for those verbs and saying that's not it at all. Um no, I just I thought that was a really good point. You guys are you guys are killing it. I'm loving listening and, and catching the uh, perspectives from y'all. Thanks. I would say the the uh, the how much Confederate flags have gone away depends upon where you live. <laughs> no, I've, I've coached in places where you pull into the high school parking lot and half the car, the truck pickup trucks have a Confederate flag on the bumper. Still. Yeah. Oh no, those I. As weird as it is, they seem to follow me. They're up north, they're down south. It's, uh, it's hard to kill. Uh, it's hard to kill the wrong idea. Um, but if we can spread, you know, ideas and, and, and like you were saying earlier, if we can spread love in the same way, those weeds can pop up. And looking forward to that. So, yeah. Floor is open, gentlemen. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm out of my main topics, but I know some of you guys had questions that you wanted to pose to the panel. So uh, please just fire away freely. And don't all speak at once. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. I, I haven't, I've been lucky enough not to have to deal with any kind of racism on the field from my own team that I've seen either at practice or in games, but has anybody dealt with it? you know, as a, at a coaching level, um, either against your own team or maybe on your own team. Um, I just wonder how you might have dealt with it. You're saying like, like a coach was – Not necessarily a coach, but like just, uh, you know, like I, I don't know. I just – I think I'd be baffled if anybody on my own team was engaged in any kind of that behavior. Um, I know, Matt, in our conference there was an issue a couple of years ago that – that had to be dealt with, but I don't know, you know, I know how I would deal with it ultimately, but has anybody dealt with that from a coaching standpoint with, with any racism going on on the field? I have not had to as a coach. Mm -hmm. Nor have I. As an administrator, as Dallas mentioned, yeah, I did as a, I'm the conference president for the Southwestern Lacrosse Conference of the MCLA and, uh, Two of our teams actually played against the same opponent in that same season. And one player was um, a black young man, and the other one was, um, I believe, Indian or Asian. It doesn't matter, obviously. Uh, but two different schools. And uh, over, I think it was a three week, so one weekend, a weekend off, and then another weekend, I got reports. And unfortunately, and that's something, that's a good point, Dallas. Um, in the lacrosse community, we don't have easy mechanisms for reporting such a thing. And we, and we found that out as a conference. We found that out as a national organization, the Men's Collegiate Lacrosse Association. Um, there's, there's that reluctance. I think Brian or, or, or Trevor, one of you guys were touching on that. There's that reluctance to go to your coach. Um, the first incident, 
didn't get reported until after the second one, believe it or not. Because once we got the second one and we verified it, we put it out to our entire conference that the message, you know, first message is always standard one, we don't tolerate this, we're looking into it. It, it. And it was aggrieved against one of our players. So I took that very personally. Um, so it, the mechanisms aren't there and the player that came out second, but actually it happened to him two weeks prior, only because his coach spent three or four hours with him over the course of three days, um, getting to the root of it because the player didn't want to say anything because I think someone said, you don't want to be that guy. And that's, that's a, that's a major problem we identified and, and I don't have an answer today, but it's something I posed to this panel and any person watching this um, across community, you know, I don't know, there's no easy answers to all this stuff. That's why we're having the conversation, but I gotta love having to start having a conversation somewhere. But if any of you have a, like to ask, ask anybody have any pointers or anything? Um, fire yeah. what? I mean, I've been. Trevor, you, you go ahead. Uh, I, I was saying, I've been in situations where, you know, maybe the coach wasn't racist, but in high school, uh, I've been on a team where, like, he's heard racism to me and didn't say anything, you know, like he didn't stop it. He didn't stop it. Or, or he knew how some of these guys, some of the guys talked and some of the guys thought and he didn't approach them about it. Yeah. That goes to that saying that, uh, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I heard it last week. If you're, if you're not stopping it, you're complicit, something of that nature. Uh, Condoning it. You heard it. Right. And I, and I remember it was, on that team, we had our pities, like one side of our pities were black and one side of our pities were white. And we were like walking through a drill and I was on the black team and I was, he was like using me as like me and this other guy to like explain the drill. And then he was like, all right, like I got one black guy and one white guy. And then he just like started laughing. And then like, uh, and then everybody kind of started laughing. And like, I don't really think that, that that was racist you know that's not racist and because i'm black and like if you don't see that then like you can't like you probably don't have great eyesight you know like you can't say that you don't see that you know like it's <laughs> like that is what it is that's not racist you know yeah. but like in that moment when like he knew that other people were saying things and like thought a certain way and he didn't say anything and then he said that and then like kind of started laughing. And I know like those guys were laughing too. Then I was kind of like, like, who's, are you like, do you have my back? You know, but like, I don't think he was like, he didn't say anything racist to me. Like that wasn't racist, you know? I think uh, Trevor, uh, I'm sorry, Dallas, to your, to your question about, you know, have you had to deal with any um, situations like that? I, as Matt knows, I've, run the youth lacrosse club here in summit for 22 years, uh, got off the board just about four years ago or so. But during that tenure, uh, two or three times I had to deal with coaches, not for issues of race, but inappropriate behavior. Um, and I think the message is that you have to be consistent and you have to be just, and you have to be, um, uh, expedient with your decisions. I don't think you can, you have to be upfront with them and you have to react quickly to them uh, when they're, uh, when those uh, situations are, are brought to your attention. Um, and I know that, you know, I know that we've always struggled with it, both on the girls and the boys side, um, you know, getting quality coaches is a tough thing. So when you're dealing with that youth program, uh, you have a limited amount of resources that you're able to deploy to coach. And sometimes you have to spread your, 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 your team pretty, your, your coaching staff thin because uh, you've had to make some harsh decisions to move some of these people along. Um, their heart's sometimes in the right place. They're volunteering their time, but it's just inappropriate and you need to react quickly to it. Thank you. Okay. I've, uh, Sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, the, the couple um, 
experiences that have come up for me out here in Colorado and, and coaching youth lacrosse have been typically from um, people that don't understand the history of the game, understand the history of the game at all. Um, and uh, one time was at a was at a tournament where um, we were playing a team from from the reservation from down in New Mexico, from one of the reservations down in New Mexico. And a parent, um, this wasn't on my team, but it was on an all-star team I was coaching, you know, yelled at the kid to go back to where they came from. And mm. I couldn't couldn't believe it. I mean, first of all, these 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 are Native American kids. That's where the game came from. And second of all, you know, if we want the game to be a great game, we should be well. Obviously, the team was a beginning team. The kids had just started playing, um, but we should we should be encouraging kids, especially at the youth level, at any level, but to be to be playing and taking the game on. So I had to, you know really fiercely approach those parents and get after them uh, for that to make sure it never happened again um, after the game. One time that I didn't do my job was uh, a number of years ago, uh, had a, a black boy on one of our young teams and he just kept getting called. <laughs> Everyone's going to be like, oh, there goes, there goes a tyranny yelling about the referees. But um, he like literally... <laughs> <laughs> he literally wasn't even touching the kids like was not even touching them and the ref was calling possession pushes and throwing the flag and then threw the kid out of the game for like three possession pushes i was like dude that's not even a rule you don't <laughs> this isn't, you, you don't foul out for possession possession calls and um i i you know, I addressed it after the game, but I really should have con confronted it more. You know, I think I was worried about getting thrown out of the game or whatever it was, but it was so blatant. I should have confronted the ref right in front of that kid. So he knew that someone was looking out for him because it, it was, it was, um, it was outrageous and it was obvious. Um, so those are a couple of experience. I've definitely, I've definitely seen, um, things like that happen at the youth levels more when I think people are less disrespectful or newer to the game and don't understand the way they should be carrying themselves and, and speaking <clears throat> in a spot spoke before about having a good mind around the game. I um something I've been thinking about a lot recently is as a lacrosse coach and as a lacrosse coach as everybody on your coaches um that if your kid's playing in a game right and you're clearing the ball and he screws up in the clear and you start screaming at him for doing the wrong thing but yet you never practiced it in practice who's really at fault right the kid that screwed it up or you as the coach for not teaching it to him right that's bad coaching to to, to yell at a kid for something that was ultimately your fault for not teaching it properly in, in practice. And we see that all the time in youth games, you know, folks that yell rather than teaching, yell at kids for things that they never taught them how to do right anyway. And I think that we're at a point where that's a situation with racism and that we as coaches, we have to teach. You know, we can't just say it's got to come from somewhere else. It's got to come from the parents, whatever. We have to take it upon ourselves. We have to take it upon ourselves to have the conversations um, with our kids if we want them to be the people we want them to be. We all talk about, you know, we're making young men in addition to the lacrosse players. Well, it's, that's clearly a part of being a young man, you know, a young woman right now. It's clearly an important part for the future of our country that people start to have these conversations and, and understand these things. And I think that we as coaches have to start taking the burden. Um, you know, take five minutes out of practice two times a week and have a discussion. Um, there's tons of resources online. You can find things to talk about. Um, I think it's critical. I think it's absolutely critical for that, for those things to start happening. Can I just add hey. real quick, and I'll let you guys come right back to it. I just something I jotted down. Um, U.S. Lacrosse, uh, uslacrosse.org uh, has a diversity section that is loaded with information. So to Brian's point, um, it's a good place to start. I don't care if you're in youth, high school, college, whatever. Um, 
they have really, really great resources that they've compiled with their diversity group. They've done a great job. Um, but I interrupted somebody, so go ahead, please. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to piggyback on, on what Brian said in, in response to, to the original question posed by Dallas was, you know, you also have to look at it from what side of, of the issue are, were you on? Because Brian talked about the, the AD from Roanoke, and it sounds like he handled it perfectly, right? He, he went to the, the person who was offended and, and found out about him and, and didn't, you know, shoo away th that it was wrong and, and what happened was wrong, right? He, he, he took responsibility, accepted the responsibility that someone at his institution screwed up, right? But the most important thing at that moment was finding out how Brian was and, and if he was okay and, and that he was going to be able to move forward, right? Because that could have gone the exact opposite way. You know, Brian talked about the beast inside, right? That could have gone the other way. If, the, if he didn't control himself, it could have gone the other way. So I think you have to look at it from both sides. One, is it the person who's being offended? How do you, how do you handle it there? Or the person doing the, the off offensive side of things, right? How do you handle that person as well? You know, that comes with education because mostly, most often that person's ignorant and they, and they don't know or they were taught the wrong way, right? So I think that discussion is really kind of um, specific to, to the incident right. and how you handle it. Um, I, I don't know that there's a perfect way, but I, I think Brian gave that, that and, and I don't remember the, the AD's name, but he gave him the ultimate compliment with, with how he handled it. And uh, I, I think that's a, a pretty, pretty impressive fact that, that he did it that way. But um, I, I think it's a challenge either way. Hmm. Anybody else? Well, I think it's a good time to um, let everybody say a closing remark. Um, I, I have, I could say things for an hour, but I will. <laughs> Uh, I will say that, that, that uh, we do want to make this a series, and um, next week we're going to have an all-women's panel, uh, different um, ethnicities, hopefully, and working on that. So if you have a question you're watching, you have a question to pose to that panel next week, it will be all women, players of different levels, uh, backgrounds, and, and ethnicities. The email address is otthevo at gmail.com. Letters OT, the convo, C O N B O, at gmail.com. So, uh, DJ, I'll start with you because I can see you in my screen here. Um, 30 seconds closing remarks. Yeah. Um, you know, again, quick thank you to Matt for putting this all together um, and for everybody for being a part of it. Um, this conversation is obviously, it's, it's got to keep going every time, but um, I'm just looking forward to to how we truly impact our community. Um, I think there's a lot of good strides that can be made. There's obviously a lot of gold stars to be thrown. There's a lot of skeletons in the closet that gotta be exposed. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy we're at the tipping point. Um, you know, hopefully it's gonna be better for our kids. You know, I don't have any yet, God willing for a while, but you know, um, it'll be better for everybody that we can impact. So thanks for having me on. Uh, Leo? Uh, again, it's been an honor to be on this, guys. Matt, thanks for setting this all up. Uh, you guys are all uh, uh, great guys. Um, like I've said in the beginning, uh, I think you need to be respectful. You need to be have to be responsible. You need to listen, and you need to vote. Um, those are all things that we have to do a better job of uh, in order to advance this conversation and continue to advance this conversation. So thank you very much, guys. I appreciate being here. Uh, Scott. Thank you, Matt, for, for including me. Uh, it, it was an honor to, to be on this panel. This is a great group of guys with some great thoughts and uh, definitely honored to be here. Uh, if I could leave you with one thing is, is to, you know, remember lacrosse, play lacrosse with a good mind and, and to treat each other with that same good mind and, and respect that, that everyone deserves and, and you'll go far. All right. Trevor Tierney. You're on mute. <laughs> Thanks to all you guys uh, for, for being here. Le learned a ton just from listening to all, all, all of you speak on this topic. And um, 
you know, I, I would have done this call regardless of if it was going up online, just because I think it's a, a, a powerful conversation for us to get um, into groups uh, with, with people from different races, different backgrounds, um, and, and learn from one another. And I would recommend for any young players or any coaches watching this to do, do the same thing, have your own conversations in your own, own communities. And you'll learn a lot, lot from being in that. And the last thing I, I'd like to just su suggest for any, uh, you know, white, white athletes out there or anyone interested for that matter is I, I watched a great movie uh, by James Baldwin this week called I Am Not Your Negro. And one of the things that really hit me hard was seeing some of the things they said back in the 60s or things that are being said today, like we have made tremendous progress. And those kind of things keep us from, from trying to make, make more progress. So um, just, just trying to educate myself as much as possible. That was one uh, movie that really stood out to me that was, was very helpful for anyone that wants to learn more on this topic. So thanks guys. And thanks for having me, Matt. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm. Hey, Matt, thanks so much. And, and thanks to everybody on this panel for including me. Uh, I, I appreciate it. I learned a lot and I was, I was nervous and uncomfortable going in. I'm, I'm still, it's not, these aren't comfortable conversations, but you learn something. And, and I certainly feel a whole lot better going out of it and, and a little bit more prepared for the next. Um, one thing that my player, I like coming back to my player, it's ironic that this 14-year-old uh, young man is teaching me so much. And I told him that the other day that we, we have a picture on, uh, on the RPM Instagram. I, my picture that's been up there, I think, since I first met him, it's probably almost five years, it was at my original location. I, I said, that's not a, a, a coach and student. Those are two coaches right there. We're learning from one another. <laughs> and the last thing he said to me, I asked him, what's it, what's it like to be identified as the black kid, right? And he said, he kind of laughed. He said, look, it makes sense, right? I'm, I'm the only black kid on my team. And when I go to the really elite tournament, his, his, his uh, school in Hartford, Connecticut is all uh, people of color. He doesn't have one white person on his team. And when he goes to these elite tournaments, he's the only black kid on his team. And he said, so it makes sense. And he kind of laughed, but he said, you know, try to identify me by my skill or even just look at my Jersey. There's a number on my Jersey to identify me. It doesn't always have to be the black kid, even though that's obvious. Um, so that's something that, that I'm going to, I'll always remember. And I think that's something to Brian's point that we can use um, when we're teaching, we're not just teaching our, our students, we're teaching each other. We're teaching our colleagues and our peers. If we hear that we can, we can call them out. Hey, what, what else did you notice about him besides the color of his skin? Um, so I, I, that helps me, and, and certainly I hope that's helpful to the, the panel and everybody watching. Yeah, Trevor Baptiste. Yeah, I just, just want to say thank you for uh, having me on this and this discussion, you know, with all you guys. It, it, it's huge, you know. It, it's something that I think through this whole experience, I've, uh, I've noticed, selfishly I've noticed that, uh, there was a lot that I had buried down inside that I just kind of kept burying and, and didn't really want to talk about because it was uncomfortable, you know? Um, and it's kind of funny hearing like how that's the, re the, what we need to do to get through this. And in some ways I wasn't doing it myself, you know, like I was, I was afraid to, to tell my piece or, to say how I was feeling about certain things because I was nervous about how it would be received. And I think everybody's just got to be honest with themselves about that. You know, it all starts within, it all starts realizing what you can do rather than what everybody else is doing. Um, and then you do it. I think it's a good step we're doing right here. Yeah, yeah. Dallas? Just want to say thanks for having me. This is this has been great. Um, you know, I think as coach, as a coach, you know, I didn't start playing in, really until college, and um, I didn't know a lot about the sport. And I was a history major in college, and I really enjoyed the history of our sport. And I think that I need to do a better job of teaching the history of our sport. And you know, we have a lot of expectations, but I think I need to put more expectations on myself and with my team to have more conversations. You know, and talk about 
a lot of this stuff. And, you know, we get so wrapped up in coaching, you know, it's two hours, let's get this done, let's get that done. But uh, these, this conversation has been more valuable, you know, than, than a lot of things you know, in, that lacrosse has ever taught me. You know, I just want, I just want to be better as a country and as a lacrosse community. And, you know, I just, I, I, I'm going to push to have more conversations with my team and, and with other coaches. Yeah. Yeah. And Brian, not last but not least, I know you got a strong close for us. Um, so go ahead. Um, the, the, the thing that has me most excited right now is the conversations that are going on. Yes. That question at the beginning of the, of the program, you know, what conversations have you been having? It's been like a full-time job for me for the past two weeks, um, talking to people and, and it's been exhausting. Um, there's been tears and, and anger and all kinds of things, but we're having them. Um, and, and that's the thing that for me is, is, you know, Trevor said that, you know, we have an opportunity, we have a moment. And I, and I believe that, you know, it's, it's finally starting to come out. It's finally starting to really get talked about. Um, and I think that the, the conversations are an important part of educating people and learning and listening and, and, and finding empathy, finding understanding, um, recognizing what's going on. There's another side to the other education, though, which is formal education. Um, and I believe, you know, we, we talk about, I, I just heard someone say this earlier this morning, um, maybe in Chaz, Chad Woodson, um, you know, the, the, the system's broken. And it's like, well, the system's not broken. This is the way the system was designed to work. Right, this is, it was intentionally set up. It is not broken. We need to break it and make it something different. Um, and and I, I love history. Um, I, I ended up being a theater major in school, but I, I, I started out, uh, was a history major along the way as well. And I love history. And I look back at the history I was taught and it's very much of the same stuff. My son's coming up now and it, a lot of it looks exactly the same. And you know, we spend more time teaching fairy tales than we do about what really happened in America through, you know, most of the way through, at least through middle school. You know, we, we teach about, you know, people sitting down together at a table and, and, and creating Thanksgiving, but we fail to mention, you know, the, the, what, what, what peons were and, and how that continued slavery for another hundred years um, after the Emancipation Proclamation. You know, we just leave things out that are uncomfortable um, that both, teach people why there are problems. It teaches people why black people get upset. And it also makes us recognize that we need to fix things. That this was done intentionally. This was the way it was supposed to be. Um, and the sooner we all realize that, and the sooner we all start going and challenging our, our education departments, our school boards, that no, this is not the way my kids learn in history. I will, I will not stand for it. This is not truly our history. I want my son to learn our history. I want my daughter to learn our history so that we can get better. You know, I don't care when the pilgrims landed. I, I, it makes no difference in my life whatsoever. But yet we still teach it and we spend so much time on that stuff and the things that are important to actually changing America and making it better rather than looking back at what it used to be are being left out. Um, and, and I think it's a critical thing that isn't gonna change unless we get out there and uh, I forget who kept saying, I think it was Leo saying, vote, you know, vote on your school board, ask them tough questions, demand that they're doing the right thing. And that we're educating people in a way that we can actually make progress. hundred percent. Yeah. Well said. And to all of you, um, I mean, we could keep going on and I'll probably circle back with you and have another session. Uh, the plan is to do this every Wednesday night, 5 PM Pacific, 8 PM Eastern. And next week, as I said, we'll have an all women's panel. Um, this is overtime, long overdue conversation about racism in lacrosse. Our panelists, those viewing, thank you, thank you, thank you. You just filled my heart so much this last hour and a half. So uh, I see hope. I see a, a positive future in our game and, and our game can, at least in our community, I, I really hope we can be a, be a positive light and, and help carry the ball over the line. So. Uh, with that, we'll sign off. Appreciate it. Love you guys. Thank you so much. And, uh, Thanks, Matt. Everybody be well and all the best to your families, okay? Thanks, guys. Peace. Take care, fellas. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Good night.
Join us next week as we feature an all women's panel. Pose a question to the panel by emailing us at ot at emwf.org. We'd love to hear from you.